بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد خاتم النبيين وإمام المرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته الغر الميامين أما بعد One of the subjects Imam Al-Ghazali speaks about in the book of marriage is Afatun Nikah. By Afat here, plural of Afah, he means Ilal in the Arabic language, the diseases. In another way, the deficiencies, the defects, the undesirable outcomes when getting married. You might get not what you wished for. He mentions here three. الأولى وهي أقواها العجز عن طلب الحلال. The first is not being able to support your family with halal income. He says this is the strongest. The second, not being able to do them right, to be patient with their bad character and bear up their harm. The third one is below the first and the second. One of the undesirable outcomes of marriage is that your wife and your children will be a source of destruction for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will pull you into the dunya, into seeking jobs to sustain them. These are three undesirable outcomes of marriage in general, not of a specific marriage. Now there are undesirable outcomes of a certain specific marriage. These things are unpredictable, of bad character, of not having children, or having disabled children, or resulting in divorce, or such things which are undesirable. I would like to speak about these three because I think these three will sum up all the sources of conflicts between couples. Imam al-Ghazali did not speak about marital conflicts, but he put his thoughts into these three reasons. And after having heard over many years to hundreds of couples complaining to me, either both or one of them, and having heard also people speaking to my father, rahimahullah, since I was a little kid, I have found that most conflicts between couples are caused by shaitan. But shaitan doesn't work unless he finds a certain ready ground for work. Shaitan doesn't work unless he finds some acceptance, some room, as you understand in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, when you enter your home without saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Shaitan says to anyone with him, you've got a place to stay. When you eat your dinner, without saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, or Bismillah, or even doing dhikr, shaitan says to anyone with him, or with it, it is better, more disrespect to the shaitan. It says, uh, you've got a place to stay and a meal. And we have also in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, telling us when couples get together, without uh, saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, shaitan is with them. And seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when getting together for couples in bed, protects them from the impact of shaitan and protects the baby if there is anything distant for that meeting, any children to come, they will be protected from shaitan. Some of you are here because of uh, 
marital conflicts, they want to find solutions to their problems. Or they are looking for love, to find love with their husbands, with their wives. Some of you are here to protect themselves from marital conflicts. Uh, this is what I assume, inshallah. Some of you are not married, but wishing for a happy marriage. I wish everyone, I think, who is single has, and rightly, because it is very difficult in uh, our modern time to find couples not complaining against each other. This is not due to the lack of good character in any of the couples. This is not due to any serious deficiency or lack of a good character or lack of upbringing in any of the couples in most examples. It is due to the change of time, change of expectations, due to putting high demands on each other, due to lack of uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, due to lack of uh, understanding life's wisdom, even away from religion, away from righteousness. Life's wisdom has taught people in the past a lot of good principles. Nowadays they have disappeared because you don't sit with your grandmothers, grandfathers and listen to their wisdom, listen to their stories. I'm sure that some of you have examples or stories to tell about family members from older generations who lived with each other without loving each other, but the respect they had, as I mentioned in an earlier talk yesterday, the love that uh, they tried to produce because of living together for some time, the respect, the care made them overcome their differences and they lived for 40 years without complaining. I say what I always say, and I repeat what I always repeat, something that Imam Ibn Ata'illah al-Sakandari mentioned in his marvelous work, Taj al-Arus, al-Hawil tahdib al-Nufus, we have become a nation of shakwa instead of being a nation of shukr. Instead of looking at what we have, we look at what we don't have. And here lies some of the major causes of our problems, especially in marriage. Remember this again, we have become an ummah of shakwa instead of ummah of shukr. Shakwa complaining, complain. We complain about everything, anything. If there is no reason to complain, we'll find reason. It has become very difficult for anyone to meet our needs, to make us happy, to satisfy us. It's become very difficult. If we don't complain about our parents, we'll complain about our children. If we don't complain about our children, we'll complain about our wives. If we do not complain about our wives, we'll complain about our bosses. If we don't complain about our bosses, we'll complain about our friends or about our neighbors. If we don't complain about food, we would complain about beds. If we don't complain about beds, we would complain about temperature. If we don't complain about temperature, we would complain about uh, almost everything, especially about weather. Weather is a common subject in, uh, in the UK here, in Britain. I think 30 years ago, I read, before studying English and before traveling here, I read in a book that if you want to open any conversation with an Englishman in uh, an elevator, start talking about weather. Complain about weather. It's raining outside. <laughs> that was a recommendation I read in a book. I forgot the book or in an article over 30 years ago, I think. We complain about everything. 
In summer, it is too hot. In winter, it is too cold. In fall, it is too windy. In spring, there is pollen. In the morning, in the evening, in the mosque, we complain about everything. And the common subject of complaint is our wives and our husbands. <laughs> this is the common subject when ladies meet. The first subject they speak about is their husbands. I know for sure this is not the first subject we speak about when we meet men. It's typical for women. The first time they meet, they ask each other about their husbands and they provoke each other against each other's husbands, directly or indirectly. My husband bought for me a new bracelet. Didn't your husband buy for you one? No, he didn't. He can't afford it. He can afford it, he just doesn't want you to buy you anything. <laughs> he doesn't love you. This is how a conversation starts, right? Trying just to, no, 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 alhamdulillah, our sisters are righteous. We're not talking about our sisters, talking about someone else. So, start competing with each other, showing off with each other, provoking. So, a man's wife will go back home after a family meeting, asking him, could you please buy for me a new ring or a necklace or something? Why? Yesterday we were okay, he didn't ask for anything. What's happening? He doesn't uh, know about the conversation, about anything. I cannot afford it. I would buy you everything, even birds, milk. Do you have this? Laban al Asfur? We have in the Arabic language, if someone loves someone, they will tell them, I'll bring you anything, including birds' milk. There's no such thing. Laban al Asfur. Ask for anything, I'll bring it to you. But this is only during honeymoon. <laughs> After honeymoons, all wishes are gone. And there's nothing realized at all. Okay, inshallah, I'll, I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. I'll get My it question for you. is not about you now providing or not providing. My question is for you, sisters. Why are you so demanding? Why are you being so greedy? Why cannot we... Be happy with anything that is coming to us. Don't you see on TV people living in Somalia without food? People dying, not living. People dying because of lack of food. Don't you see homeless people in the Philippines? Don't you see or haven't you seen or heard of people in Cairo, in the heart of the Islamic world, homeless people not having enough food? Don't you know in your own countries, in your own countries, this is not your country. This is your country of birth or uh, stay. If you live here, then you have to establish Islam and spread Islam in this society and make good examples for da'wah. But living here with all these marital conflicts and telling people we're Muslims, living here and uh, not practicing Islam and telling people we're Muslims, it doesn't make it your country. It will become your country when you practice Islam in your families very well. Then I believe these people will knock at your doors to tell you we decided to become Muslims. And this is what we wish for, inshallah, in the future. But it's not promising. It's not promising due to our own lack of understanding and practice of Islam, real Islam. Most of the problems, brothers and sisters, are stemming from our lack of understanding life's wisdom. I would say the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Grandparents, elders in our communities would say there is wisdom that we learn from our elders and we would like to pass it to you through sitting with them. They'll tell you about their problems, their patience, their agonies. They'll tell you stories. If you don't hear stories of the people of patience, you won't be able to be patient. Most of you have grown up on movies, feeding your thoughts on movies. All what you see in movies is pretension. Tamthil. Tamthil is pretension. 
شيخ عبد الله ابن الصديق الغماني author the book إقامة الدليل على حرمة التمثيل establishing proofs that acting is haram I have seen now in Damascus in uh, some movies or some uh, plays people swearing the word of divorce dozens of times pretending it's a divorce he would say that his wife is divorced or haram if this person doesn't do what he wants for him in the play or in the movie his wife if he is married got divorced I have seen people acting marriages in movies in the Arab world and acting a marriage pretending is a marriage because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says ثَلَاثٌ جِدُّهُنَّ جِدْ وَهَزْلُهُنَّ جِدْ النِّكَاحُ وَالطَّلَاقُ وَالرَّجْعَةُ or والعتاق. two variants three things no matter said in public or in jest they are always meant and the outcome is established the meaning of the hadith marriage divorce and setting slaves free in one variant bringing one's wife back after one time divorce with the word talaq itself which makes talaq uh, uh, retractable talaq we called it with the actual word sarih the actual word of divorce so acting pretending makes the effect established from a legal point of view and we need brothers and sisters to reshape our thoughts our understanding of how life runs life runs according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills not according to what you choose no one in this world is safe from any calamity we haven't heard of any person who lived without a calamity have you try to remember have you heard of any person who lived without calamity you might think this person or that person but reflect upon their lives and you will see that there was some calamity even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the most beloved to Allah he didn't live without calamities these calamities varied from uh, being poisoned sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam to losing children especially his male children his son Ibrahim before that Abdullah al tayyib Al-Qasim others narrated losing his wife losing his parents first of all the harm which his people inflicted upon him sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the accusations they had against him the slander so who can be safe of any tribulation if the calamity comes in terms of a quarrel with your wife that's the easiest we have a proverb in the Arabic language quarrels between couples is like salt in food can you do your food without curry maybe you do your food without salt this is why I put curry instead do you do your food without salt everyone adds salt except in Indonesia they offer rice without salt I had to eat rice without salt it's like bread for them rice is like bread instead of bread they offer it without salt so anyway if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes your calamity in this life your wife is not listening to you or your husband is not listening to you some quarrels every now and then that's the easiest form be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you do not have cancer be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you do not suffer from uh, any disease be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're not blind be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have enough food be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have a place to stay shelter 
Be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you got some education. Be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, above all and before all, you're a Muslim. Be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for knowing him, for reciting Quran. Be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all bounties which you are aware of and for all bounties you're unaware of and those are much more. Be happy. Brothers, sisters, we need to be happy. We need to accept the status quo, the de facto life. I haven't seen or heard of anyone who got a wife or got a husband according to what they wish for. Everyone makes concessions. Why after marriage do you start complaining about your couple, about your mates? Because you put high demands, as mentioned before, you put high demands, then you start measuring your mate by these conditions, criteria you put in your mind. In honeymoons, usually people pretend. In early days, weeks of marriages, people pretend, pretend a lot. They try to make everyone happy because everyone wants to keep this marriage. But after a while, the real personality is revealed and the real character now is shocking the other partner. This is not what you told me. This is not what I expected. This is not what, this is not what, this is not what. Have you been with a friend, for example, who has a habit which you don't like and kept silent, not telling him about this habit for 10 years, for 20 years? We read stories about awliya and ulama who lived with people or had students or had wives and never complained for 40 years or 50 years. They never complained. They never asked a question. Now you meet with each other brothers or sisters, you meet with each other. The moment you meet with each other, you see, for example, if we, if we speak about, you know, just obvious things, a cut in your forehead. Where did you get this from? What happened? Tell me. Oh, poor. You start sympathizing with them, making them feel like they've got a calamity and they need sympathy. You make them feel broken down. You make them feel like uh, there's something wrong with them. And this is about just a cut sometimes. What happened? Where did you get this from? How? Does it disturb you? Do you see it often? How do you feel about it? Tell me. While you should be with this person for 40 years without making him aware that you've noticed this cut, even. That's the khuluq al-Muslim. If I claim that you're my friend, and the moment you make a mistake with me, I turn against you. Or simply, no. I'm well raised up, well brought up, forgive me, I'm just acting now, telling what people say. I don't uh, cut ties with you, but I'll give you a warning. If you do not apologize, I'll not keep my friendship with you. What kind of friendship is this? What kind of brotherhood is this which makes you need to apologize to your friend? If there is need between friends to apologize to each other after years or weeks or months or days, after some time you've been together, you've had food together, and I'm making you, putting you in that position, humiliating you in front of me to say, I apologize, forgive me, excuse me, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. You're not friends. This is not the right of friendship or brotherhood. Let alone having this between couples. You want your wife, the mother of your children, to apologize to you. You want the father of your children to apologize to you. I won't bring you back. I won't be happy until you say I am sorry. Your happiness is now in humiliating the other partner. You're happy on the calamities of others. This is not a khuluq of a Muslim. One of the beautiful characters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ighda. 
إغضاء إغضاء is making yourself unaware of your friend's mistake. Making yourself unaware. You did not notice. You do not let him know that you've noticed some of his mistakes, some of his errors, some of his deficiencies. You don't make yourself aware or appear to be aware. Hiding this emotion, sometimes it should be it would be a shocking feeling, but still you need to hide it to make your friend totally behave in the same way. Because I know, for example, now you have a lot of adab with me, you have a lot of love with me, Jazakumullah khairan, I don't deserve it. But I know, for example, if someone misbehaves, someone amongst you misbehaves with me, and I notice it and make him aware that I noticed this, I think they would really be too much embarrassed, probably they would not show themselves again in front of me, they would hide, they would, out of embarrassment, because I know how much love you have for me, mashallah, barakallahu fikum. I don't deserve it. I know love is for the ilm, for the nasab, for, I personally doesn't deserve any of these things. But uh, may Allah reward you for this. The same also with your friend. If I take you as a friend, I should not make you aware of any deficiency, any defect in your personality. This is what you are, I accept you as you are, not as I wish you to be. If your parents couldn't make you better, would your friend make you better? No, but your shaykh, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the awrad, with the suluk, is capable of making you better, inshallah. Not him personally, the shaykh, but the dhikr, the impact, listening, your obedience, your adab, your love for the shaykh will make you better because you want to be like the shaykh. This is the best motive. Because people don't want to be like their parents, often. People won't accept any advice from their colleagues, from their friends, especially from husbands and wives. People will never listen to any advice given to them by their mates. Yet, they listen when it comes from the shaykh because of the love, because of what the shaykh represents. This is what we were talking about yesterday, the legacy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. This authority from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given to them. So this is one key point, brothers and sisters, in solving our marital conflicts or in avoiding any marital conflict. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, in sa'aka minha khuluq, sarraka minha khuluq. There is something you don't like in your wife. The same also, there is something you don't like in your husband. But there are a lot of things you like. So one first remedy is when something happens, your husband, your wife does something you don't like, the first thing is remember all the things you like. Now she's arguing with me. But alhamdulillah, she's beautiful. Alhamdulillah, she tries her best to raise up the children in an Islamic way. Alhamdulillah, she is righteous. Alhamdulillah, she protects her chastity. Alhamdulillah, she, 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 and so on. The same for you also. He doesn't bring you gold. Well, but Alhamdulillah, he's providing halal. Alhamdulillah, he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, he uh, is giving me my rights. Alhamdulillah, he is so and so and so and so. You can count the many things, and there are many, many things which are good, done by every partner. Expecting high before marriage makes you get in a state of shock. Trying to reconcile with your own psyche makes it difficult. So some words will creep out of your mouth which disturb the other partner. This is not what I expected. This is not what we agreed upon. This is not what your parents told me about you. This is not what you told me about yourself. No, keep silent. Keep silent and keep your other partner having high opinion of you or thinking that you still have high opinion of them. And this is a key point in a successful marriage. I won't make you feel that I discovered the bad things in you. I make myself totally unaware. This is Ighda, the khuluq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Probably the worst example would be, I remember one story, my father was asked. A man got married, 
to a girl claiming not to have been married before, and the night of the wedding, he discovered she was married before. Married or not married? I'm avoiding certain words here, which uh, I don't like to use. Uh, this is sometimes uh, one major condition, the chastity of women is sought by men. And when a woman is claimed not to have been married before or involved in any marital relationship, legally, illegally harassed or uh, raped or whatever, when a woman claims not to have been involved or touched in another way by men, the man on the night of the wedding would be shocked. So a man came to my father asking, him about what he discovered. First thing, my father asked him, did you tell her anything? Did you ask her anything? He said, no, 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 I didn't tell her anything. He said, do you love her? Did you pick her up and you love her? He said, yes. He said, stay with her, keep this marriage, and don't make her aware that you discovered this. And your marriage will be successful your wife will be like a slave for you, loving you in the future. The man continued his life, was frequently coming around. My father, my father kept his secrets, and uh, still, I don't know about the person himself, but this is an example. Probably the worst of all scenarios, because this is probably the most demanding condition in any marriage people put. You never know what's the cause of this. And you don't want to investigate. You love the person for what the person is. Don't put now an interrogation. Why? What happened to you? She might have been attacked while she was a young girl. She might have uh, gone astray and repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She might have been involved in an earlier marriage, unsuccessful. She doesn't want to tell about it. Several scenarios, several reasons would be. But uh, the whole point is about you selecting the person. You selected the person for what cause? For the beauty, the beauty is there. For righteousness, the righteousness is there. Not for the past. You didn't select the person for their past. And the past doesn't affect the present. When the person has repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is you who is going to bring the past and make it a problem in your mind and probably make the person weep over it or start having a problem defending himself or herself. This is something that is very important in a successful marriage. On the contrary, if we take another example, a wife might discover that her husband has been with a girl. He comes home, they have their own sneaky way of uh, spying on their husbands to smelling perfume, trying to pick up hairs uh, or something like that to uh, see what's been happening. Now, you might discover that uh, your husband has been with a girl. Now, your job here is to be the best for him, to improve yourself to see what's wrong with you that he needed other than you. That is the major point. The major point is not now about him committing this sin. This problem, we will handle it with him separately. His shaykh will handle it, his uh, father, or him with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll repent. Someone will remind him of Allah. Your job is not to make him repent or not. Your job is to ask the question, why did he need other than me? What's wrong with me now? There is something wrong. I have to improve myself. And this is in bed's relationship. You have to talk to yourself about this level. To handle the situation from that bottom level. Putting the question that uh, you committed zina, haram, I'm not going to stay with you, is going to break your marriage. You picked up your husband that he is righteous. This is what we are assuming. And a righteous husband is not protected from sins. He might commit something wrong. We have to see what led to it. And you're the first person who is asked, who is meant, why he's looking for another woman while he has a wife. 
So something is wrong with his wife. It might be not that reason, something is wrong with his company. Something is wrong with his friends. Something is wrong at work. Something is wrong if it is something wrong with his own personality and he continues this always, then of course that would be a different story. We're talking about a righteous husband who makes a mistake sometimes. So the problem here is about people immediately confronting each other with each other's problems or faults or bad characters. What is uh, causing the trouble is this confrontation, not the real deficiency. We accept from our bosses worse than these things, and we are so kind to our bosses at work every day. We accept from people we socialize with every day much worse situations, but we don't accept it from our life partners. Why? Because they are challenging us. You're telling me I'm not good? I am good, I am better than you and your parents. This is what some people say when they get angry, right? No, alhamdulillah. <laughs> You're telling me I'm not good? I'm well raised up. My parents took care of me in the best way. Go and look at yourself. You're doing so and so and so. They start picking up everyone's deficiencies. It's become now a competition in who's worse. Everyone wants to prove to the other, you're worse. No, you're worse. Is this why you got married? We don't do this usually with our friends. We don't do it at work. We don't do it in school. Why do we feel so comfortable at home doing it with the people we love, with the people from whom we got our children? You're a friend of mine. I have to respect your father because you're a friend of mine. Don't you have to have some respect for the father of your children, for the mother of your children? You love your children, at least if not for your sake, for the sake of your children, you have to give your life partner some respect. What would you think? Imagine one of the worst scenarios would be if you die before your wife, your wife is angry with you, and your wife will spend the rest of her life complaining about you to your children. Your father used to treat me this way. Your father used to mistreat me in that way. Your father, make dua, Allah show mercy to your father. I suffered with him a lot. <laughs> Do you wish for such a scenario? Your wife, after your demise, is complaining about you to your children, making your children have this bad image about you. You're not like this. It's just you couldn't handle some problems in your marriage, some deficiencies in your, in your wife's personality. So brothers and sisters, be thankful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And remember that the easiest forms of conflicts are the marital ones. So anyway, every time I go out of my home, I assume that it might be the last time I'm seeing my wife and my children. This is something which my father, rahimahullah, taught me. He said to me, when you leave home, don't leave your home angry. Because you might die in a car accident and uh, cause trauma to your children, to your friends, to the people around you. So you want to leave your family members in the best form. You're happy, you're smiling, telling them how much you love them. For example, don't blame your children or get angry with them first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning when they get up, they should see your smile. Don't make it the last thing you tell them before they go to bed. Make them get angry and then go to bed being sad, being shocked that their parents, the closest to them, are not happy with them. Children have no other recourse but their parents. You make them uh, go to bed and sleep uh, upset because of something wrong they did. They'll see bad dreams, nightmares. They'll grow some psychological disorders. The last thing you leave home, if you are angry with your wife, don't go out leaving her unhappy and you're angry. You might die in a car accident, uh, God forbid. You're uh, 
age might have just finished, your lifespan expired, and your wife spends the rest of her life now thinking that you died while you were angry with her. How do you expect people after you? So don't uh, think that you're unique. I have seen, wallahi, so many people claiming to be the happiest people on the face of the earth while inside they had so much troubles. Can you pretend that you're the happiest person on the face of the earth even if you are under debt, your business is not successful and everyone around you is against you and nothing is happening as you like? Can you be happy? You should be happy because still everything is happening according to the will of Allah and you are a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should be happy for all these things. I've seen ulama, I have heard stories of ulama, awliya, whose wives were unfriendly to them and they bore up with that. In a beautiful story, there was a shaykh just changing the air a little bit and mentioning some stories. There was a wali. He had some murids. One of his murids used to come and visit him. Every time he visited him, he narrated that he saw the shaykh working in the forest, coming back home, always holding a strap. And the strap was tied to a lion. A lion was walking with him, serving him, listening to him and obeying him. Yet every time he came to visit the Shaykh, whenever he doesn't find the Shaykh at home, he knocks at the door, the Shaykh's wife kicks him away. Once upon time, he came to visit the Shaykh, knocked at the door, he heard a kind voice from inside. Yes, is the Shaykh here? No, he's not here. He went, wait outside for some time, he'll come soon. Do you need any drinks, any, knowing that he has come from far away? No, thank you. He waited outside. The sheikh came, but there was no lion with him. There was no lion with him. So the sheikh received him. After a conversation, he asked the sheikh curiously, where's the lion? You used to have a lion. The sheikh told him, I had a wife with very bad character. Because of my patience with my wife, Allah rewarded me wild animals were serving me and obeying me because of my patience with my wife. I decided to change my wife. I divorced her, got married to uh, another wife. She's so kind to me now, but animals now, wild animals never obey me again. <laughs> you think you're doing business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're going to lose? If your life partner is unmanageable, you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to compensate for you somewhere else? Or you think if your life partner is unmanageable by pushing away this harm, you're going to be safe from all other harms? Every small calamity pushes away a higher calamity. If your calamity is your wife is not listening to you, that is the easiest in this world. Because the toughest thing in this world is to have your wife listening to you. The same also for husbands. Don't think it easy. The easiest for me is you listening to me. But the toughest is my wife listening to me. If she listens to me, if she believes in me, if she has adab with me, then it means I don't say I am good, but hopefully, inshallah, I would be good. If your wife respects you, if your wife listens to you, this is the toughest thing in the world to have your wife or your husband, sisters, listening to you or obeying you or doing what you want or having good adab with you. Because your personalities are revealed in front of each other. You can pretend in front of your sheikh, although you pretend, but uh, the real personality is hidden and usually the awliya, I'm not one of them, the awliya are advised to cover up on their murids and not to tell. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them often speak of what is wrong with their murids, with their students, to give them their rizq and their need. This is why I started yesterday with Afatul Uzla, never finished the subject or never spoke about it. 
And today also I have the book between Adab al-Nikah and Afat al-Uzla trying just to pick up something suitable to you because our goal, especially for such a subject, is not to read the text alone. It's to get some remedy for our social problems and above all for our spiritual problems. Lack of yaqeen, lack of iman, lack of tawakkul, lack of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are very important things to notice. So if you can convince your wife, if your wife loves you, respects you at least, then it means you're good. And if uh, she doesn't respect you, if she shouts, if she disagrees, if she doesn't listen to you, it's not a big deal. Because this is the, the toughest person on the face of the earth to convince. And remember how bad you are, and there is every reason for her not to believe you, not to listen to you. And some, some simple examples. I talked about this in some talks before. In uh, the first section in Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari, there is Kitabu Bad al-Wahi, the beginning of Revelation. The beginning of Revelation, this is the first section. In it, he related to us the hadith of uh, how Wahi came, revelation came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The major hadith is the hadith of Iqra. When uh, Jibreel came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, squeezed him, released him, squeezed him, released him, squeezed him, released him, saying first time Iqra, then second time Iqra, then third time Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returned to Khadija and told her the story told her what happened. What was her reaction? This is what you should take as an example, sisters. And also brothers, take it as an example, because sometimes you might go home telling your wife that a miracle happened to me. <laughs> yeah, truly. A miracle may happen to you. I mean karama here, non-prophetic miracle. I say miracle just for uh, brevity. A miracle may happen to you. You go home telling your wife, your wife won't believe you. This is very typical. Why? Because she knows you very well. You got angry, you lied, you're practicing backbiting, you're doing this, you're doing that. So she won't believe that a miracle happened to you. The Prophet ﷺ returned to his home and told Khadija, the first reaction of Khadija was, كَلَّا وَاللَّهِ مَا يُخْزِيكَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا إنك لا تصل الرحم وتحمل الكل وتكسب المعدوم وتقر الضيف وتعين على نوائب الحق. Nay, by Allah, Allah will never put you under this stress. You treat your relatives in the best way. You help people who want to travel back to their homes who don't have enough money to find mounts to reach their homes. And you treat your guests in the best way. وتكسب المعدوم. You bring your family everything available. Or وَتُكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومِ You give the poor people enough. And you help every person under calamity. This is the praise of a Sayyidah Khadija to her husband, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Imam al-Bukhari quoted this hadith to prove to us that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a true prophet with the best character. To prove to us two things that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a true prophet, and second, to prove to us that he has the best character. Because if there was anything wrong, as Sayyidah Khadija, his wife would be the first person to pick it up and tell him about it. This is why the first people who believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam were his family members. His wife, as Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, Sayyiduna Ali, who was raised up in his home, like his son, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took him from his father, Abu Talib, agreed with Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas took Ja'far, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took Ali. Ali was raised up in the house of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his lifetime friend, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala an, he was his friend from the age of 25. They traveled together to Sham and went back. These were the first people who followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and believed in him. So don't be upset if your wife doesn't believe you or doesn't obey you because this is the toughest task on the face of the earth. No matter how close to each other you are, but still it's very tough because your personalities are 
just revealed to each other with no pretensions. You cannot pretend. So brothers and sisters, uh, I'm going to give you a break now just uh, to start uh, all afresh again, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.